Okay, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, everyone, I am Beth Mendelson. I work at the OWL Research Institute, which is in Western Montana, here in Charlotte, in the beautiful Mission Valley. And we're a really small organization. We've been studying great gray owls for a number of years now, and they're kind of my specialty, the species that got me started on owls. And so I am really excited to talk to you today about great gray owls and snags, um, which we will get into a little bit more about what is a snag and what we do at the Owl Institute um, in regards to snags. So thank you everyone for coming. And this is the first time I've done this particular presentation. So please bear with me and I'll definitely welcome questions at the end. Okay, so the Owl Research Institute, we are a very small organization. We focus on most of the species that occur here in Montana. Montana actually has more species of owls than any other um, state, which is a pretty great place to study owls. And we have our director, who's Denver Holt. He founded the Owl Institute uh, over 35 years ago. Um, and then we have two other full-time people and a few seasonal techs, and we rely on volunteers and donors uh, to support our work. <clears throat> um, gray grays is one of the species that we do research on. And since I started with ORI over three years ago, we've been able to uh, kind of increase our research on gray gray owls um, here in the Mission Valley of Western Montana. Um, they're a really neat species to study. They're called elusive for a reason. They can be very difficult to find and study. And so that's one of the things that makes it kind of fun for us. Um, so here in the photos, you can see part of the work that we do can sometimes involve banding of the owls. And the photo on the left, you can see our um, field tech from last year, Soleil, who is handling a great gray. And as you can see, the wingspan of the gray gray is about as tall as she is, which is about five and a half feet tall. So kind of cool to see that size and how large their wings are. And then on the right, you can see our other field tech, Chloe, was holding an owl in the hand. Um, these are both female owls, so a little bit larger than the males. And when they're perched, they may look you know, kind of about the size of a great horned owl. And then when they spread their wings and fly, you can really see how large they are. Um, by height, they are the tallest owl, I guess you could say, but they do generally weigh less than the great horned owl. All feathers. Okay, so one interesting thing about great gray owls and really most owls is that they rely on existing nesting structures in order to breed and reproduce. So you can see this beautiful pair of owls here on the left. It's not something that you commonly get to see. It's a really special experience to see actually two gray grays come together. Uh, most commonly you'll see that in the spring and sometimes in the summer. And you can see the female is the larger owl on the left and the male is the one closer to the tree trunk. Um, but so the owls, they come together and they pair and they do some courtship activities and pair bonding. And one of those things they do is to find a nest site where they're able to lay their eggs. Um, and so they rely on something that already exists. In this photo, it's a red-tailed hawk nest that was used by great gray owls. And that's one of the things that they will choose to use. But the important takeaway here is that they can't build a nest like a lot of birds do. Can't, I don't know, maybe they could, but they don't and they probably won't. Um, so the other thing that they like to nest on is snags. And that's kind of the more iconic great gray owl nest that you might think of when you picture a great gray owl nest, if that's something you do, um, which I do. And snags are these old dead or drying trees that are still standing. And sometimes they're broken off at the top, sometimes they're not. And they can take really long time to form and they're really important for a variety of different wildlife and all sorts of creatures. We'll go into that a little bit more later. So when we're studying great gray owls, 
our main goal is to find these nest sites and figure out what they look like, what characteristics that they have, so that we can better understand what great growls are choosing and requiring for nesting and how we can use that information for conservation. So it's a pretty long process to get to that point of conservation for us. The first step we do is surveys to find the owls. And this photo is actually only from probably four weeks ago, three or four weeks ago, uh, when we were out doing a night survey for great gray owls, which as you know, most owls are nocturnal and they use hooting to communicate with each other, to defend their territories and to find mates. And so we can use that to listen after dark and hope to hear great gray owls. And when we do hear that, we know that we're near um, great gray owls who are attempting to breed. It takes a lot of surveys and a lot of legwork to detect these owls. They're not like a great horned owl that is hooting really all year long, maybe all night long sometimes, and you can hear them a lot. Great grays, they only hoot occasionally and their hoot is a little bit lower and more sporadic. So it can be really difficult to find these owls. So after we've done the night surveys and we've seen or heard owls, we go back to those areas and we search for nests, which can be a very um, arduous process. We have to walk transects usually through miles and miles of forest. Usually we're looking at old growth forest, which is the preferred habitat for great gray. So really tall trees, lots of down timber um, and sometimes steep slopes. Uh, so here we are walking through the forest and what we do is we basically scan all the trees to look for anything that could potentially be a nest. Um, we have a forester, ex-forester who volunteers with us and he calls it looking for defects, but really anything that stands up. So a broken top snag, obviously those stand out pretty easily. Um, or you might have a mistletoe in a tree and that's just sort of a dark clump in a tree. <clears throat> nest searching, here we are kind of taking a break. I think this was day three of not finding a nest, but knowing there was, we were in an owl territory. Um, so maybe a little frustration there, but uh, it's, it's pretty cool to be able to just go out and hike all day and find owls. Hopefully when you do find it, it's always worth it. So here's kind of what we do find, what we're looking for. And I know these photos aren't great, but that'll give you kind of an idea of what it's like out there in the field. On the left, you can see my finger is pointing towards a blob near the top of that tall ponderosa pine. I think that pine is over 80 feet and the nest was at probably about 60, 65 feet. Um, and it's a stick nest from a red tail. And you can you know, just see it when you get to the right place in the forest and find an opening. And then on the right, I've circled a snag there. It's leaning over. It's actually a pretty massive beast of a snag. It's tall, it has a large girth to it. Um, but it can still blend in in the forest. So when we find these kind of structures, what we do is we circle them, we listen, we look from all angles and we look for sign of owls, which could be maybe one little feather, uh, maybe a pellet, maybe some hooting, something like that. Um, so here you can see this is zoomed in on that stick nest. Uh, and this is with a, a really powerful camera. Sometimes we use a scope to look a little closer. And I'm just gonna decrease my screen here a little bit. Um, and then you can see there's a female. This is a little bit later in the season. So there's a female with a couple of chicks and there's a male coming in with a vole, giving them prey. So if you're lucky enough to witness that event, it's pretty obvious that you're looking at a great gray nest. And this is zoomed in on that snag that I had circled two slides ago. Uh, this is the top of the snag, and this is the male. Again, he just came in with a vole. He came in with prey, and the female is down inside that snag, and you really couldn't um, couldn't see her at all. You could maybe see through the crack that there was one or two feathers in there, but sometimes uh, they're really hard to see. Okay, so after we've found the nests, we monitor them. And usually we do behavioral observations with a scope from a distance 
to check on the nest, see how they're doing, see how many chicks there are, if there's any predators in the area, um, that kind of thing. So we take our observations usually uh, once a week, maybe a little bit more from a distance and take a lot of notes. And here is another nest we were monitoring this past season. You can see if you look at this one a little more closely, the chicks look kind of similar in age and size. The one on the right might be a little older. And if you go back to that last nest, if you look behind the one in front, there's a little teeny tiny one in back. So there was a little bit of an age discrepancy in those chicks. So these are things that we're able to look at as we monitor the nests, how many chicks there are. This nest we believe lost a chick or maybe one of the eggs didn't hatch in the middle because these two chicks were about five days apart in age. Um, sometimes we get to ban the birds, which uh, can be fun and, it's, and it can be really useful for our research. Through the banding, you can see the picture of the wing here on the right, we're looking at an adult female gray growl's wing. And if you look really closely, you might notice that some of those flight feathers look a little bit different in color and wear than the others. And we can use that to age them through their molt. So if we can see different generations of feathers from different years, we can successfully age the bird up to sometimes four years and then adult after that. Um, here's a fledgling. On the left that Steve, who I think is listening right now, is, is holding and banding. And through banding the chicks, we're sometimes able to tell if there's their survival. For example, if we find a chick that's deceased, we can tell which chick it was. And if we're lucky enough to be able to, tr to find a chick at a nest or another territory when it's an adult, we'll be able to tell exactly where that chick came from. Same with the adults through banding, we can tell that individuals tend to return to their same nests in territory years. Okay, so after we do the banding and the chicks leave the nest and everybody, all the owls are kind of gone for the season, we go back to the nests and we measure the habitat. So here you can see we have a tree climber volunteer who's shimmying up that same snag. Um, that was, I think it was probably about 45, 50 feet tall that he was climbing up because part of what we do is not just measure the characteristics of the surrounding habitat, but we actually wanna get the dimensions of the nest itself. So the interior dimensions, maybe the height of the walls, to determine why the owls are using certain nests over other nests. Sometimes we use a ladder to climb up and so we can actually look in most of the nests, which is really neat. Here's that same nest and that tree climber unfortunately was not able to get all the way to the top. It just was not safe or accessible. So we had another friend with the drone come over and take some photos from the air of the interior of the snag, which is a really cool way to see inside and look and see that, wow, this is like a really soft bed inside. It's really eroded. It's an older snag, so it's soft and not spiky. Um, and it you can sort of start to see why the owl might've chosen that space over some others. Um, so what we think is that not all snags are created equal. We have not really finished collecting all that data, but we look at a lot of snags and we notice the interior characteristics of some are like this one. Sometimes we might look at a snag from the ground. It looks perfect. And then we look at it from the top or with our special camera and there's like a big spike in the middle or something like that. And then we can say, okay, that snag is not suitable for great growls to nest. After we've collected all this data, um, which we are still in the process of doing, but I think we have data from close to 40 nests at this point in Western Montana, which is a pretty good data set. Um, just for an example, some years we only find zero to one great gray nests in our study area, which is pretty large. And some years we might find up to eight. So it can take a while to actually get enough data 
to make it a significant um, conclusions here. So here's some of what we're preliminarily finding. As I mentioned before, there's different types of nests that great grays choose to nest in. And the three main types are snags, stick nests, and mistletoes. Mistletoes we haven't really talked about. Um, those can be a variety of species, but they're basically, we define them as um, growths on trees that create some kind of platform. And sometimes we'll even find that red tails or even goshawks will build their nest on top of a mistletoe. So it's kind of both types of nests. Um, but often great grays will nest in a mistletoe or behind a mistletoe. And so they're not even always relying on stick nests that are built by other raptors. So what we found so far is that snags comprise 53% of the nests in Western Montana. Stick nests were 40% and the remaining 7% or in mistletoe. So you can see that snags are pretty important for great grays. And it's also interesting that stick nests are often chosen as well. And that's a question that we're starting to look into as well. Like, are they preferring snags? Are they choosing stick nests only when snags are unavailable? Or do they actually maybe prefer stick nests um, for a variety of reasons? So that's part of our research as well. Uh, we've looked at data on the height of snags, and this uh, chart here just shows you the minimum height, the average height, and the maximum height of snags that we're finding. So as you can see, there's a really wide variety of what we've seen great gray owls nesting on. Um, the minimum one we've just seen a couple of times, occasionally a great gray owl will use a tree that's actually was cut down years and years and years ago and left kind of a big stump at about three and a half to five feet tall. So occasionally they will use those, although not often successfully. More often they're using snags that are at least 25 to 30 feet tall. And we've seen them up to 60 feet tall, like this one on the right here. If you look really closely in there, you can actually see a human standing at the bottom of it. So that'll give you an idea of how tall that snag actually was. We also measure the DBH of snags. The DBH is the diameter at breast height, which is about four and a half feet. Um, so you can just measure that and that'll let you know how large the tree is. And again, we're finding a large variety of DBHs that are available for great grays to use from 3.7 feet wide all the way down to 1.2 feet. So some great grays uh, will use very small, sometimes aspen or lodgepole pine snags that make suitable nests, um, but the average is about two and a half feet DBH, so pretty large trees. Okay, so now that we've collected all of this data, we can start to use it for conservation, which is part of our mission here at the Owl Research Institute. Um, and we want to figure out basically how to protect this vital habitat that the owls are using. So the first step was finding the owls, um, finding their nests, and then figuring out what characteristics of their nests define them. And the next step is that we disseminate that information to others, including agencies that um, manage the forests. Um, this particular photo here in this sign was just a wildlife protection zone that we worked on with a couple of agencies um, around Missoula to help protect hunting habitat for great gray owls, which is another important aspect. So what are some of the problems that snags are facing? Why are snags kind of becoming this important issue? Why are we starting to think about them more and talk about them more? Well, it's because snags are rapidly disappearing from the landscape. And here's a picture of my sister splitting firewood for me, but this is one reason around Western Montana that snags get cut down. They're usually, there's dead trees and they make great firewood and we need firewood to stay warm in our cold winters. So 
we harvest snags sometimes for firewood and that's a problem that can be fairly easily prevented if we um, manage that. And also many management techniques for forests involve cutting down trees and snags are usually protected in that and we are able to actually use our data with the Forest Service and other agencies to give them um, our measurements for snags that are important for great grace. Here you can see this was a clear cut in an area that had great gray owls and I believe this was done for fire mitigation and that's a pretty common occurrence around here where all trees are removed. There's also other treatments such as thinning. Um, I call it landscaping where a lot of people like to just remove snags because they think they might be sort of ugly or potentially dangerous because they carry disease that could spread to other trees or they may fall on your house or something. And so part of what we do is just educate on the importance of snags and try to make snags seem more beautiful and more useful to wildlife. Um, last summer, we were able to work with some wildlife biologists here. We work on a reservation, the Flathead Indian Reservation. So we were able to work with the tribal wildlife biologists to share our data that we found in some break rail territories that were um, in some timber harvest zones. And so here's one of the biologists going out and placing these tags on trees to make sure that when the um, treatment is done and the loggers come in, that they will save these specific trees, which can be a really important component of snag con uh, conservation that we do here. Here's the result of that in that same area. Uh, we were back in there this spring. We did find the owls right in this area. They're still there. And this tree is marked as a wildlife tree with a W to keep. And you can sort of see behind it, there's other trees that are marked with the red paint, which means keep those trees. Um, so a really important part of snag conservation in relation to great gray owls is the surrounding habitat. And that's something that may not be the case for all species, but for great grays, it's not just about a single lone standing snag in the middle of the field. That's not gonna be useful for a great gray. They actually rely on other habitat characteristics, which we measure as well, like canopy cover and um, density around the tree. And generally they prefer um, snags that do have some canopy cover, do have some nearby trees um, for cooler temperatures, for camouflage, and only to protect the chicks, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so snags form naturally, basically. Here's a photo of a snag that was a great gray owl nest, and then it blew over in a big windstorm. Um, which is normal, that happens. And, and so we need to make sure that when we're managing for snags, we're not just protecting existing snags, but we're creating the appropriate conditions so that new snags can form. And snags can form in a variety of ways. Um, you know, anything that causes the tree to die, disease, fungus, insects, um, lightning strikes, fires that move through, um, old age, drought, flood, and animals are just a few of the things that help snags to form. And the important takeaway here is that it takes many, many years for a snag to form that would be usable for a great gray owl nest. And it can be hundreds of years if you think about first the tree has to grow and it has to be usually an old growth, older age, large DBH tree. Um, and then it has to either die and fall over or snap off and start to rot. And that process, depending on the habitat and the diseases or insects present, can take many, many, many years. And, and so it's important to manage for all ages of trees within the forest. Here's me with that same tree. Um, kind of cool to see that was the top of the tree and I was just looking around inside of 
the top where the gray grails had nested just to see if I could find anything in there after that tree blew over. And that was actually the second gray grail nesting snag in that small area that fell down. And we haven't been able to locate the nesting pair of owls soon. And there really aren't too many other great snags in that area for them to nest. So we're not totally sure what happened to the owls, uh, but it seems like maybe they ran out of opportunities to nest and they probably moved on to somewhere else. Here's a great picture of an owl snag in a dug fir tree that looks like it's kind of a newer, um, newer snag. So it'd be more hard rather than soft. The top looks a little bit spiky, um, but this owl is still deciding to choose that for a nest and managing to nest on there, which we don't see too often. We generally see them preferring the older eroded out snags. Here's another common type of snag that we see often around here, especially in riparian areas, are cottonwood trees. Um, they often create really nice snags that are soft on the inside and great for the owls to nest on. And here's a picture of an older tree snag. So this one has been around for a long time. It's been a nesting territory uh, for years. And this is the oldest snag in the area and, and um, it kind of stands alone. And, and you can see that it's taken many, many years for the snag to form. And here's a close up of the top of that snag when the great gray owls were using it as a nest, which they used it for many years. You can see that it's it's large, has a lot of space and a lot of protection and, um, from the elements and from predators and things like that, as well as the nearby trees that can cause, create shade. And this is a photo of that same nesting area a couple years later um, that had some trees cut down in the area. And so it pretty drastically modified the habitat directly surrounding the nest where a lot of the trees have been removed. And so we're curious to see what kind of effect that's gonna have on the owls. So far, they have not returned to that nest since this has occurred two years ago, um, but we do occasionally see them in the area. So part of our research is kind of looking at whether they're gonna use those kind of nests where the habitat has been modified. Um, it can be a little bit difficult to make those kind of determinations because owls, like many species, um, don't nest or reproduce every year. If there's a low prey year, they won't initiate nests or they'll go somewhere else where there is better prey to nest. So it can take a number of years to determine what's actually going on. Okay, so I mentioned the surrounding habitat earlier can be really important for great grays, and it's something that we measure and something that we're really working on um, conveying to forest managers and landowners in regards to creating good great gray owl habitat. Fledglings, we call them fledglings, but when they leave the nest, they're not actually fledged, which means they can't fly for almost two weeks after leaving the actual nest itself. So they'll sometimes be on the ground and then they will rely on existing like leaning trees and branches to get up as high off the ground as they can and climb up other trees to survive. So it, we often see them on leaning trees, which they'll climb up. They'll use their talons, their wings and their beaks and they can climb up these things and then hop up branches and get really far off the ground where they're much safer and that's where they'll wait until they are able to fly. And with chicks that remain close to the ground or on the ground, they are very vulnerable to predation. And we see that pretty often where these exposed chicks are taken by bears or other raptors and other predators. So why are snags important? We've definitely touched on why they're important for great gray owls. Um, they really depend on snags for nesting, but a lot of other wildlife species 
also rely on snags. And here's, I'm just gonna show you some of the other owl species that we study that also use snags. Um, there's a boreal owl here on the left and they nest in snags as well uh, in tree cavities. So those are often found in older dead and dying trees. They can be natural cavities that have formed or commonly woodpecker type holes, as you can see in the tree on the right. If you count, let's see, one, two, three, four cavities down from the top, right in the center there, there's actually a little northern sawwood owl poking out of that nesting cavity there um, in a large tree. And those are probably woodpecker holes that have been created for woodpeckers to nest, and then the owls take over those holes. And in the middle is a screech owl, again, in a cavity in a big old cottonwood tree. Here's another example of a saw wet nesting in an old, old aspen tree that has a cavity created probably by a northern flicker. Um, and saw wets nest in cavities. Often these are found in dead and dying trees. Um, so if you look closer inside a snag or a dead or dying tree, you might find that it is in fact being used as a nest. And this is kind of a one, one of a kind photo uh, that Daniel Cox took for ORI of the inside of a Northern pygmy owl nesting cavity. And um, pygmy owls use these tiny, tiny little holes like usually from sap suckers or smaller woodpeckers to nest in. So they're very well protected and you can't see into them very well. So um, it's a pretty cool opportunity to be able to look inside of a cavity. And as well as studying great grays and snags, or I also studies the nesting characteristics of a lot of these smaller cavity nesting owls. So we have a great database of measurements and characteristics for northern solid owls and northern pygmy owls that we're compiling as well to look at what is the size of the cavity opening? What is the depth of the cavity? What is the tree species height of the cavity? Things like that to start to learn about why are they choosing these specific habitats and how can we better protect them? Great horned owl here on the left, they often nest in snags as well, broken tops, um, sometimes cavities as well in trees, larger holes in dead trees and a northern hawk owl on the right. They like to use these old snags often in burned out areas uh, that are hollowed out for their nests. Um, yeah, barred owls also will use snags. They like chimneys that go deep down into snags. Their nests can often be hard to find and hard to see as well because they're in the interior of the tree. Sometimes it can be really hard to tell if wildlife is using a snag. Um, you know, it might just look like a dead tree with a few holes in it. And here's an example of a pygmy owl chick that hasn't quite gotten ready to fledge, but he's starting to look out, which means he'll probably fly out of that cavity within a few days. And that is just one little clue that, wow, this tree is being used by wildlife to reproduce. Generally, the pygmy owls don't look out of the hole, um, so you really have no idea if there's one in there or not. Um, same with other wildlife species. Sometimes they just stay in the tree, and you don't know if you're thinking about cutting down that tree. It's hard to tell first, so just take a pause and think about what might be living in that tree. Squirrels, flying squirrels, um, raccoons, you know, anything could be in there. Here's another example of how it can be really hard to tell if there's anything living in a snag. This is a neat photo of a flammulated owl in a cavity as well. And the last one of a pygmy owl peeking out, um, probably checking out whoever is climbing up that tree. And that's all I have for you guys today. So thank you very much for listening to my presentation on great gray owls and snags. Um, I just want to remind everybody that we are a very small nonprofit organization and we really rely on 
um, volunteers and donations from generous people to keep our research going and get all this valuable data and get it out to the public and to the appropriate management agencies in order to help with conservation. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions. I think we have some time left for that. So. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Beth. That was uh, that was awesome. Um, so we've got quite a few questions for us. So um, let's start. So Anna's question is, do you do any remote detection of owl hoots, such as setting up a recorder to record in a certain area over a long period of time? Yeah, we just started using automatic recording units this year. Um, you know, the, the units are great and they're becoming pretty valuable in research but they're pretty cost prohibitive for us. And we were just lucky enough to have an amazing volunteer who actually made us some recorders. Um, and so that made them affordable for us. And so this is our first year of experimenting with those. Um, we have about 30 units and we've relocated them each about five times. So we have data from about 150 units this spring that we're starting to compile. And from that, we are definitely able to detect where there are vocalizing great grays, barred owls, um, long-eared owls, pygmy owls, and solid owls. And from that, hopefully go back and use that data to find nests. So, yeah. Awesome. Uh, Stephanie asks, are great grays competing with other owls or birds for these pre-made nest sites? Um, do any of these competitors have an upper hand or negatively impact uh, the Great Grays? Yeah, I think uh, negatively impact. I'm not sure exactly who, you know, I, would, I don't want to take sides here, I guess. But yeah, there's definitely competition for a lot of these nest sites. And there's a chance that that could be, you know, an issue if there's not enough nest sites. Um, we, we usually see Great Grays taking over red-tailed hawk nests. And that doesn't create too much of an issue because the red tails can build their nest. So they go ahead and build another nest. Um, we've seen great grays and great horns sort of fight over nest sites and there can be mortalities in that case. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, generally the great grays, you know, they're the larger species. So they tend to be able to, to take the nest over and if it's a species that has built the nest they can usually go ahead and build another nest. Yeah. Uh, do you find that at any of the nests that the owls use do they get used by like the red tailed hawks later in the season or any of that kind of situation? Um, no no I haven't seen that around here the red tails usually start nesting a little bit before the owls. Um, which an experience last week where um, we were observing some great grays and there was an old red tail nest that had been used last year nearby and the great grays were hanging around it. So we were hoping they were setting up to use that nest and then just sort of out of nowhere, out of the sky, a red tail comes in and just whacks the great gray and then keeps on going. So um, I think, yeah, there's a little bit of animosity there <laughs> um, between those two species, but yeah, the, the, Great grays can just take the nest of the red tail, I think. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Uh, are forest fires out west having an impact on the availability of snags for owls? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think we haven't directly dealt with too many forest fires in spots where we know there's been nesting owls, where we've confirmed nests. So. I'm sure they are, and there can be some benefits to forest fires, especially some of the less hot, faster moving fires will actually create snags, you know, not immediately, but a lot of the old snags that we see getting used by great grays are, are fire marked. Um, so I think fires can be important if the fire is, you know, the right type of fire, I guess. Um, and where we are, we do see, we don't see the kind of huge, like out of control fires generally in our great gray owl habitat. Um, Matt asks, how do you get your hands on an owl to ban them? <laughs> oh, that's a trade secret. Can't share that here. <laughs> Variety of methods, and I can assure you that um, the owls don't are not harmed in the process. The humans usually are not harmed either. Sometimes we're slightly embarrassed, but. 
Uh, Stephanie asks, what time of year are you seeing great grays nesting and what does that mean for the food resources that are available to them? Yeah, that the time of year just definitely varies wherever you're located. Around here, we've seen them lay eggs as early as March 20th and as late as April 20th. And this year, we've had a really late winter, as I think a lot of people have. And so there's been a lot of snow on the ground. But the benefit to that is the snow created sort of a cover for the voles, which is the main prey species for the great gray owl. And so there's a pretty ample prey source in a lot of sites. So we're waiting to see. We don't have any nests that we know of that have eggs yet, um, but we have a couple more weeks until we know. Wow. Uh, Larry asks, are the old red tail hawk nests abandoned or do they sometimes come back the next year? Do they like flip flop? Yeah, that's a good question. I, hmm, I've never seen them come back. The red tails come back the next year. Often after the owls use it for a couple of years, it's not in the best of shape. And the red tails have generally moved on and built another nest, but sometimes close by they'll use it and I have seen that with great horned owls where sometimes the great horned owl will use a nest and then the red tails will use it and they'll kind of flip flop. Um, Joe asks that I live in Vermont and um, my dad lives in Connecticut what types of animals might use snags in our area are they um, would you expect different different animals in different places? Yeah um Certainly, I don't know much about the wildlife in Vermont, unfortunately, but a large variety of animals will use snags, you know, from other types of owls like barred owls, eastern screech owls um, use snags, um, mammals like squirrels, um, raccoons. Uh, we have flying squirrels here, um, some diurnal raptors as well, kestrels. Merlins, um, and then, you know, woodpeckers and other cavity nesting small birds as well, nuthatches, chickadees, those kind of species, bluebirds, you know, they can create a habitat for so many of the bird species that we see. Uh, Stephanie asked, how long do you typically see snags uh, stay upright or remain usable before they come down? Yeah, I wouldn't say I have like enough years of experience to really say, and I think we've had some pretty severe windstorms in the past couple of years that may have been a little bit abnormal um, because there's there's records of snags that have been used by great grays for over 20, 30, 40 years. Um, and then we've seen, like I mentioned in my presentation where a snag falls down and then the next year, the next one falls down. So I think it just depends on the habitat. You know, if you're, if it's in a wetter area with cottonwood that has some flooding, those snags don't last as long as a really older growth, deeply rooted snag. Um, Matt asks, I have built owl boxes on our place here in Colorado. There's lots of land, no neighbors, but so far no luck after two years. The nests are 30 to 60 feet up, mainly in pine trees. What can they do to uh, make it more attractive? Yeah, I guess it depends on what um, owl or bird they're trying to uh, attract with their nest box. But I always tell people to think about the surrounding habitat like we talked about with great grays. And a big piece of that is food. They're not gonna nest near there if there's no food available. So for owls, creating habitat for small mammals is really important, which a lot of folks don't like to do necessarily around their house and lawns. Um, you know, but if you have like brush piles or taller grass or stacked wood or something, you can create good habitat for voles and mice and little critters, uh, if you're talking about raptors. And then having like nearby perches and other types of trees for owls or birds to hide in is also very useful. So I would think about, you know, the species that you're trying to attract and what other habitat characteristics besides just, you know, the tree with the box on it would they need. And two years is not a long time. A lot of owl species in particular, they don't breed necessarily in their first year. They might take a while to roam around and find mates and find territories and choose nest sites. So I would give it a little bit of time as well. 
Um, Quinn wants to know, what is your favorite part of your job? Okay, my favorite part of my job is that moment when you find a nest for any species. It, it's always, you know, the hard work and long hours and early mornings and stub toes and blisters all pays off when you see, you know, a great growl tail feather sticking out of a snag or something or, or a little solid poke out of a cavity. It's the best thing ever. Oh, oh that's great. Um, great. So I think we've gone through all the questions that I have here. Uh, so again, thank you so much, Beth and our, the Owl Research Institute team for joining us today and taking part in our Owl Festival. I You're hope welcome. you all thanks for having me.